Uh, so hi, my name is Lakshmi Devi, and I was involved with a film called Don't Be Afraid. It's called Dero Math in Hindi. I produced it, I wrote it, I acted, and I kind of co-directed it. It's a lot of That's work. it? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I shot it in two days. Um, I flew back to India, I live in New York. So I flew back to India, I shot it in Mumbai. I had a wonderful cast, so it wasn't that hard. I mean, the fact that we had to shoot really, really fast was probably the only hectic thing. But I had a wonderful team, so I guess that's what happens when you work with great people, you know? Something like this happens, so yeah. <laughs> what about you? Uh, my name is Rafael Sparge. I'm the director of The Bird Can Fly, and, and Noah Kelman is the uh, co-composer and, I guess, uh, engineer as well. Um, so I'm thrilled to have him here with me. I, um, this is odd uh, that I would uh, do this movie, uh, but I, I found myself in a situation where I, I met a Korean gentleman through a friend, um, and he told me his family story. And, um, you know, we're all immigrants. I mean, we, we all are here. Um, whether uh, by force or by um, seeking opportunity, or you know, um, uh, we, we've all come here. And and in point, in fact, actually, there's a. It's beautiful that you've programmed this with these two films uh, because they are. Yeah, they're just great. We should just do a traveling with you and me. Um, I you know I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I you know this takes place in K Town in Koreatown in Los Angeles. I lived in LA, but but I I was very struck by the humanity of, of these struggles and these stories and um, uh, and and like perhaps you you know I mean I loved your movie. Thank you very much. And and, and the amazing thing is how. Um, the faces and the relationships transcend the language, right? You, you, you feel them through just just that, that last se sequence of you on his chest is just so beautiful. And um, again, it just transcends words. So I believe that we're particularly at this point in time with where we are in the world and with you know uh, our administration, etc., these stories have become more poignant than ever, and and these stories should be told. Um, there's so many extraordinary stories in the in, in the fabric of that make up you know what this country is. Mm -hmm. Very true. We we started off the uh, the festival with um, I don't know if this is on. Or we started off with uh, an immigration program. So this fabric of you know immigration and how quickly this tapestry builds in New York and people coming from all over the world with, um, in some ways, there are similar woundings, if we can call it that, you know? It's so true, it's so true. This film yeah. has been, I've taken it to several festivals, and I always get this larger than life sort of um, question answer session more than anything. Of course, everyone likes it, but then they have so many questions, you know, which I love answering. But uh, the funny thing is, it has screened in India also in a few festivals. I didn't really make it for the Indian audience per se, because this is just life there. It's not much of a movie, you know. They ask, so what? Yeah, so <laughs> you know, it's not much of a movie. I kind of wanted to take it to a different kind of audience so that they would get a flavor of what goes on back in my country. Now, there's so many wonderful things, but at the same time, there's such a heavy hand of patriarchy. Uh, there's uh, so much of sexism, it's hard to breathe at times, and I wanted, and it couldn't be normal, you know? And I was made out to be the weird one because I kept thinking it wasn't normal. It looks like I'm not so weird. The rest of the world thinks so too. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> that being said, I do like it when people ask me all kinds of questions because it creates a certain amount of awareness and the fact that it's not normal, and whether you're Middle Eastern, Indian, Pakistani, Afghani, or anyone, even Asian as a matter of fact, uh, all of us have pretty much the same line of emotions and stories going on. You're attached to your family so much, but at the same time it can be excessively manipulative, and there's a tug of war. It's like a guilt trip from the time you're born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just, um, it, it has its pluses, but I think you have, yeah, 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 there is, there is. 
But I'm not so amazed at Raphael how you captured, this is not your culture, right? And you captured in this film the, the real heartbeat of the story. Uh, could you tell us about that a little bit? And then maybe we could open it up to the audience and you know, just let you guys take it over from here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so, so the story that I was told was essentially um, this businessman had come to the States and his, um, he made a lot of money very fast and essentially got into uh, some wildlife. He came with his wife and they had two children and a third. And this man that I met uh, told me the story that his one brother was serving life in prison. The other one was a 15 year surviving meth addict and he had made it through. And, and I, something about that story just uh, hit my heart in a, in a really uh, profound way. I, I, Vivian Bang, who plays the mother extraordinarily well, um, uh, Rob Yang, uh, these are actors who are friends, and Joe So, uh, they're all very accomplished actors and know the Korean culture and, and, and help me accountable, which I was so grateful for. I, I just, you know, for me it was really about just listening a lot and, and trying to sort of set the stage for them. Um, uh, I, I was really interesting directing scenes in Korean where I had no idea what they were saying. But again, I, I just found it, um, I, I had great trust in, in, in their inestimable talents. And, uh, and again, you sort of try and find the emotional line. Um, and um, what, what, I'm, what I've been thrilled about is that this film has uh, gone to Asian festivals, won Asian festivals, and it's gone to non-Asian festivals, and done very well there, and, and, and here we are. So, so, I, so I, what, what I had hoped is that some of your film is that you can go back to, to India, and it can speak to that audience, but it can also sort of transcend out of that audience. And that's, and, and, um, that, that's what I'm, uh, uh, I'm very grateful for, yeah. Um, no, you, you also did the music with Grace Kelly, who's a, a, a Korean American and uh, lived in Cape Town. I mean, is there anything you want to say about the, your 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 journey since you're here? Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, um, everything. First of all, beautiful film. Really enjoyed it. And everything you guys are saying was really, really important from the musical perspective. Because I think one one challenge that we really faced is it would have been really, really easy to simply play up the emotional arc of the story. But I think that that was almost really only a small part of what was actually happening on screen. And so musically, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys remember, but there was a folk song in the middle of the film. And that kind of was actually the impetus of all of the music for us, because we wanted it to be very, very honest to the culture. And we didn't want to overplay the emotion, which was already being really, really well captured on screen by all the actors. Um, so for us, it was really, Thankfully, Grace is so incredibly talented, and she plays all these beautiful wind instruments. Um, so we were able to take this acoustic sound and play off of that traditional folk sound to really capture almost the spirituality and the culture more than anything, um, without stepping on the toes of the, the emotion of the characters and the story itself. I just want to say one last thing, and then I want to turn it back um, or turn it to the audience. We we finished the edit, um, and you know, it's, it's, you make you, you write the script, you shoot the film, you edit it, which just takes forever. And then I had we we finally had a picture lock. It's like we got it. Okay, this is it. This is it. And then my editor turned to me and said, "Okay, now you go do sound." And he said, "That's half your movie." I was like, "Are you are you crazy? Are you out of your mind?" And you know, he's right. He was right. I mean, it, the soundscape and and the and the work that that the sound department does really creates the intimacy with your audience in a way that was uh, sort of mind-boggling to me in terms of really understanding this process. Yeah. Yeah. I think it also really helps in differentiating between an amateur movie and good filmmaking. I think sound is where it plays all the difference. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you guys. <laughs> 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 With no bias. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, should we open it up to people? Yeah, any yes. questions? Yes. Yes. Have any questions? Should, can we borrow one of the bags and maybe um, sure. give you one of the boards? Hi, thank you all for the, the films. Um, I had a question for you, Lakshmi, um, about the the initial opening scene where she's okay. seeming to have like an anxiety attack yes. with the dog barking and mm -hmm. 
obviously that threaded throughout the, mm -hmm. the film, mm -hmm. but if you could say more about mm -hmm. what the sort of underlying uh, motivation was for creating that element, mm -hmm. um, like did that add to her character in terms of us conveying how uncomfortable she was in everyday mm -hmm. situations, mm -hmm. or was it like something else that you intended to convey? Um, for, that's actually a brilliant question. I'm happy to answer that. For most of uh, the Indian middle class, or lower middle class, or, I, you know what, that isn't true. For most, um, apart from a few of the metropolitan cities, um, our upbringing is pretty much the same. Uh, the only difference being uh, the importance of education may vary depending on whether it's the south or northern part of India. But um, this is pretty much us. We are brought up in very, very protected environments. Um, all the only men we know are our brothers or our father, and probably an uncle. Uh, that's all that we know. Um, we're not allowed to talk to anyone else, even if we do talk, it's within minimalistic tones. For minimalistic reasons, we don't really have life and life conversations. Uh, one of the biggest, hardest things for you to handle is if you get attention as a growing up girl, you're blamed for it. It's not something to be proud of. Um, it's something that's founded upon, so you're in a constant state of anxiety. The cultural uh, uh, environment is very different. Um, luckily, when I was growing up, you know, by that time we had music and um, iPods and CDs and Walkmans or whatever, so we could put stuff in our ears and look down and hold our file and walk straight so that you didn't have to hear the nonsense that was going on around you. If you pay attention, it's a problem. If you don't pay attention, it's a problem. One of the biggest reasons as to why I did this movie was uh, to kind of form a story around a girl who was treated by a man as an actual human being, where he actually saw her and said, you should write your exam, and treat her like a person, and ask her her opinion. Uh, in India, especially in the South, I come from a place called Kerala, we have 100% literacy. There is no person, man or woman, who isn't educated without a college degree. I myself, I'm a doctor. Yeah, I had to go to medical school to become a filmmaker. That's how crazy it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you just study, man. It's all that you do, you study. But that being said, it didn't really change anything for me. It, it's still very much the same thing. You are expected to act accordingly, and no one ever asks you what you think. I have a degree, and no one asks me, what do I think? What is my opinion? You're told what to do. And if you say anything, it's considered disrespective. So the anxiety that was there, I mean, it is kind of an ode to how I was and a lot of my other peers were. I mean, I'm really not like that anymore. But, <laughs> you know, just life happens somewhere along the way. But uh, so many of my classmates and my friends in medical school, high school, whatever, these girls are so smart. I mean, oh, they just did brilliant, but they end up becoming nothing but glorified housemates. And it's okay for them. Sometimes a simple joy is just all the joy that they'll ever expect. So it becomes hard for me to sit and watch that and to be able to make a movie based on that. But the women are to a very large extent. Now it's changing a little bit here and there, but it hasn't changed on a much larger platform. Probably girls are a lot more talkative now, you know, because there's reality shows and a lot more cable and TV. So we talk a lot more now. There's a lot more co-education and all of that and at work. You still have to study. So many jobs are outsourced to India, so you have to talk to men. <laughs> and so all of that is fine, but the core is still the same. Every day in the morning you get up and you wake up and you have to prove that you're a good girl. Because that's all that actually matters at the end of the day. Okay. Dear Lashmi. Dear Lashmi. Oh, Maga. Hi. Yes. Hi. How are you? Congratulations <laughs> for your performance. Thank you. Uh, like I say every time, you really great actress. Thank you. Because <laughs> seeing you sitting there and seeing you in the movie, Really, are, they are totally different person. I never, I don't see the real Lashmi over there. And my question is, yes. how is possible being India uh, so 
patriarchal, sorry, my English is not very well, patriarchal. Yes. patriarchal. Mm -hmm. How is possible mm -hmm. India have the possibility of having a prime minister, mm -hmm. women prime mm -hmm. minister, mm -hmm. and then here in the United States, who it was open mm -hmm. for women, rights, and everything of mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. we don't have. How do you see living here? How do you see? So about actually, that. that's also another brilliant question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, that's because over here, if you have a woman as a president, it will actually matter. It would be a big deal. In India, it's hogwash. Every time we say something about women and sexism, they say, but you had a woman prime minister, so what? Didn't change anything. Almost every, I think it's five to ten minutes, five to eight minutes, if I'm right, I believe that someone is raped in India. We have a certain element of rape culture that has finally been addressed to a certain extent. It's disgusting, it's degrading, but it is the absolute truth. It's hard for me to say this, being coming from there, it pains me, but it is the truth. But over there, when you have women in higher positions, it doesn't mean that the society has changed. It just means that they are there at that point of time. Indira Gandhi was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, who was our first prime minister. She belonged to a very, very, very faint family. We do have a few leaders who are women here and there, but then that does not change the actual basis and core of our society, which happens to be extremely sexist. But in the States, we look up to women over here because they stand up for what they believe in. They're louder, they're stronger, they're opinionated, and they make life actually matter. So if you have a woman president here, <laughs> that pretty much changes the entire way that the whole world kind of looks up, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, will, will look up at a woman after that because the U.S. is considered, uh, what do you say, um, one of the, uh, uh, the strongest nations for a reason. It really is, and I think one reason why it's considered a superpower is because of the women here. It's because they have made a very vocal difference, if I may say, you know, and I guess it scares them. So that's probably why it's a huge deal here. And it doesn't matter. Even if you have the head as a woman, there, it is most of your work is conducted by men. And that is the brutal truth. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, time for one more question. I have to have time for God. I have a question for Raphael. Hi, Raphael, Steve. Hey. <laughs> hey. How are you? Um, I know you, uh, you know, as an actor, you've got, you know, an amazing career. I just wonder if you could talk about how, about uh, going to the other side of the camera and uh, how maybe you drew from your, you know, your acting experience, how that informed your uh, directorial uh, practice on this film. Yeah, thanks. Nice to see you too. Um, I, I uh, yes, it's true. I mean, I've, I've been an actor for a long time, and, and I uh, this has been sort of a, a a progression, I guess, of working in front of the camera. Um, I started at four on Sesame Street, so it's <laughs> fifty years now. So, um, uh, I, you know, uh, about. I, I was a teacher for about 10 years. I still work as a teacher sometimes, and uh, I love working with actors, and I, um, I, I love the minutia of, of telling stories. Um, I've been doing a lot of documentaries now and doing um, uh, a six-part series for, for PBS, KCT in Los Angeles, and, and I'm, I'm interested in stories. I'm interested in, in, um, in I guess, taking the mechanism of what we do as actors and then trying to sort of find a way to translate it and then to set it into a story. This was wildly ambitious for my first narrative film. Wildly ambitious, and, and had I even thought about it, I would have thought, what the heck am I doing? But I, um, again, I, I had such wonderful actors and, um, and they kind of uh, led the way. So, you know, for me, um, having worked with hundreds and hundreds of directors, you know, the best directors for me have stayed out of my way, um, and yet always been wonderful listeners, and and then really sort of encouraged moments, just moments, without overwhelming um, the experience, just moments for discovery. And um, um, the scene that I just so I'll leave it at this: the scene where everyone's in the room where they kind of blow up, and um, the, the the mother is hitting the sons. 
Um, that's a that's a very ritualized thing in Korean uh, culture, which I learned about. Which is when the when the younger brother goes astray, the older brother is responsible, and then he is shamed and beaten, and um, and and it's a sort of a um, it's a very specific thing in the Korean culture. Um, I really just sat back and let them go, and and uh, we talked about it at great length. But then they they did it, and and uh, anyway, that I, I guess. Um, this is also says uh, I trust my actors, and um, and that's maybe what I've sort of been able to sort of learn by really being an actor and becoming a Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Oh, last question. <laughs> last one. Yeah. The bird of the fly, and the actor Arthur, I mean the character Arthur, said something about the bird who could fly, and then the rest of the sentence, which I couldn't make out, and I'd really like to know. Yeah, the, the bird who could fly doesn't tie himself to ones in cages. And, and of course, that's in the scene in, in the jail, right? So, so um, uh, it, ultimately, it's about Arthur being able to sort of find that moment where it all clicks, and he can make that shift. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. That was really amazing. Thank you uh, thank for uh, having this wonderful festival and oh, for these thank you. your programming yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, for, for celebrating filmmakers. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you so much.